Thank you, and good evening, everybody. I'm talking to you this evening about wild astronomy, which means, according to the subtitle in the sort of top left-hand corner, you can see the idea is photographing animals during the day whilst you're on holiday, on safari in East Africa, but also photographing the stars at night. So in other words, you just, well, sleep when you get home, basically. <laughs> so this is what I mean by wild astronomy. I was lucky enough many years ago to find some friends who had the same interests as me. Interest in wildlife and looking at wildlife through binoculars. Interest in astronomy, looking at the night sky with binoculars and maybe telescopes. But also an interest in photography. And luckily enough, all of those three interests overlap. Because if you go to various parts of the world, you might find wild animals. And if you can get away from light pollution, you might find beautifully dark skies as well. And if you have an interest in photography, well, of course, you can take pictures of those animals that you're watching, and you can take pictures of the night sky. So wildlife and astronomy and photography all overlap into what I call wild astronomy. And what I'm describing here is going on safari with some friends of mine to Kenya and Tanzania over the last few years, dotted around the last couple of decades. So I'm talking about going on safari. Some of you might have already tried this, but for those that haven't, I'll give you an idea of where you might go and what you might take, where you might stay in lodges or perhaps tented camps. The fact that if you want to see animals, you could in principle stay in one place and let the animals come to you, or you can go on game drives in the morning and the afternoon to see the animals. How you go about capturing it all, and a lot of what I'm going to show you here are my favorite wildlife photographs taken over the last 20 years or so. And I'll finish, as well as dotting a little bit throughout the talk, the idea of taking pictures of the night sky as well. So let's start with going on safari. If you did decide to go on safari to Africa, what would you need to take with you? Well, it depends on where exactly you're going, but I'm restricting what I'm saying to my experience of visiting Kenya and Tanzania. I would love to go to other parts of Africa, perhaps Botswana, perhaps South Africa, but at the moment I'm just talking about Kenya and Tanzania. The two largest cities there in Kenya, that's Nairobi, in Tanzania, that's Dar es Salaam. And my friends and I have visited quite a few national parks, and those are indicated in red there. I'm not necessarily going to tell you which picture of which animal came from which national park, but as you can see, they're dotted around the country. If you wanted to try and do the same thing, then I suggest you pack a few things in your luggage. You will probably need sunscreen, sun cream, because it's usually sometimes cloudy, but there's often a lot of sun out there close to the equator. I suggest a hat. I suggest insect spray. I have, don't think I've been bitten more than once in the last 20 years, but it's always worth spraying with the insect spray to make sure. And just in case the insect spray doesn't work, make sure you take your malaria tablets just in case. Recognizing an elephant, most people are okay with that. Recognizing a giraffe, most people are okay with that. But birds, there are hundreds of species of birds. Maybe you want to take a good bird book with you. They're available online, or you can take the good old-fashioned paper version so that you know which birds you're looking at. You don't need particularly large binoculars. I have found that 10 by 42s are fine. They're not so big that they weigh around your neck, but they still gather plenty of light and give you the magnification you need to see birds in more distant trees. When it comes to photography, I'm not going to tell you which camera to buy, but when I started going on safari 20 or so years ago, I started with good old-fashioned 35mm film. People remember that? Yeah? Okay. The downside was you had to figure out how much film you're going to use. If you're going to be away for a fortnight, do you take one roll of film or ten rolls? Or Well, you basically had to guess, and the answer is you always get it wrong. So you guess, and then you double it, and then you have a chance of actually taking the right amount of film. It is possible to buy film when you're out there, it just tends to be rather expensive. Of course, we have now, many of us, moved on from 35mm film to digital photography. So all you need to do now is slap in an SD card 
and you can get a terabyte if you wanted to on an SD card and save hundreds of thousands of images. I don't advise doing that. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You're probably better off to have a few SD cards, um, each of which can hold many thousands of images. To give you a ballpark figure, when I go on Safari, if I'm away for a fortnight, I might take quite a few thousand images, maybe two, three, four, five thousand images. Not all of them are absolutely fantastic. You're not going to see all 5,000 of them, don't worry. <laughs> You're just going to see some of the edited highlights. Now, your first, your first sight of Africa is not going to be the grass savanna of the Serengeti. It's going to be Nairobi Airport or something like that. But eventually, hopefully, you will be on the road. And if you've got a driver guide to take you out to your first destination, a driver guide is vitally important if you want to get the most out of your time on safari. You don't necessarily know the best places to go to see various animals. The driver guide will be an expert and will be able to take you to where you need to go. So having arrived at Nairobi Airport after an eight or nine hour flight, it hopefully is only another hour or two before we get to our first destination and get our taste of Africa. That might be sitting on a terrace overlooking a watering hole, or it might be just a random view into the African bush. When you look at the picture in the bottom left, you might say, well, there's not an awful lot going on there. But then you say, oh, actually, yes, there's actually quite a few zebra here when you look at it. And as well as there's, oh, yeah, there's an elephant there as well. Yeah, OK, yeah, an elephant. Oh, and look, there's a giraffe behind the elephant. Yeah. And oh, look, to the left of the giraffe, there's another two elephants and another giraffe. Um, sorry, another elephant and another giraffe. The more you look, the more you see. And that's how it actually works in reality. If you just drive along completely blinkered, you will miss the animals. The animals are there. Sometimes they are in your face obvious. Sometimes they're just standing behind a tree. So you do occasionally have to just look and think about what it is you're looking at. And sometimes a slight change of perspective will suddenly show you a whole load of animals that you didn't realize were there. So this particular shot actually contains about 20 animals in frame. You just don't instantly see them. But they are easier to spot for real, live, when you've got a pair of binoculars, you scan the bush, and then you see all these animals there. You don't have to go by road. You can fly from one place to another, but it does get very expensive. It's certainly the quickest way of getting from A to B, because the roads in much of East Africa aren't generally very good. Flying will get you there faster, but it's a lot more expensive. So you'd have to cut down your holiday if you've got a certain amount of money, a certain budget to play with. The airports that you fly in and out of are not huge. They tend to be, well, that's about as good as it gets for some of these airfields. That's uh, Rufiji International Airport. That is the, uh, the, the, the taxiway, effectively. Uh, if a plane is coming in, they usually overfly the runway first just to scare off the animals from the runway to make sure that when the plane lands, it doesn't land on top of any animals. Not good for the plane or for the animals. So let's have a think about where you might want to stay if you went to East Africa. Various lodges, generally speaking, rooms made of stone, or various camps, generally speaking, where the rooms are effectively tents under canvas. You can see here that there's me and a few of my friends and our driver guide and friend on the left-hand side, David. You can perhaps get the gist from this image that we don't tend to rough it. My friends and I are all of a similar age. Although cost is an issue, we don't want to just go with a sleeping bag and let's just see where we go. We do tend to use lodges and camps that are reasonably comfortable. They're not necessarily the cheapest, but at least they are comfortable. You can see that from this. What's really important, the two most important factors for most of us, is a comfy bed at the end of the day. So if you have been spending a lot of the day on your feet uh, with game drives, watching animals, etc., it's nice to get a nice comfortable bed at the end of the day. Also, you can't see, tucked around the back, there's a, a nice modern bathroom and toilet, so you don't have to worry about sanitation. Notice also that, if necessary, the lodges will supply mosquito nets to make sure that, as well as you applying the insect spray during the day, the mosquitoes are kept at bay during the most sensitive time of uh, twilight, for instance. So the lodges and camps do everything to look after the guests. 
Most of these lodges will have fantastic views. There's one over the Masai Mara. The Serengeti and the Masai Mara are effectively the same grasslands. It's simply that if the grassland is in Tanzania, it's called the Serengeti. If the same grassland is in Kenya, the other side of the border, it's called uh, Masai Mara. So this is a, a, a particular lodge which we rather like going to, and it overlooks the huge grasslands of the Masai Mara. A little bit further east than Nairobi, there's a national park called Savo East and Savo West, and here we find, again, one of our really uh, favourite lodges, which we intend to visit again in hopefully only a few weeks' time, because in this particular case, the lodge has this terrace, and you can just sit there and overlook the watering hole. Okay, at the moment, the watering the hole doesn't seem to have an awful lot of action going on there, but generally speaking, if you wish... You don't have to think about getting into a van and going on game drives to go see the animals. If you prefer, you can simply book into this lodge, sit on the terrace, and just watch the animals come. In some cases, you can almost set your clock by them. The baboons come in at 10 o'clock. They have a drink, and then they go away. Then the zebras come in and have a drink, and then they go away. Um, you can almost time the giraffes and the elephants and the various animals as they come and go during the day. So there's one of my friends, Rob. This is a sort of contented man sort of photograph. Here he is, sitting on the terrace, pair of binoculars round his neck, a camera on a tripod waiting to photograph birds or animals at the watering hole, flicking through a bird book, trying to work out what was the bird that he just photographed two minutes ago. And whilst you're doing that, somebody will come and bring you coffee every once in a while. Or something slightly different, if that's your preference. And that's one way of spending your time. Literally, just stay put close to a watering hole. The animals will come to you. And from a vantage point like that terrace, you can get some wonderful views as the, as the animals line up to do their drinking. In this particular case, this is a set of eland. These are the largest antelopes in East Africa. And in this particular case, just very close to sunrise, we were just about to leave this particular lodge, and then we realized these eland had come down. The water was still relatively undisturbed, and so we got this beautiful shot of the reflections of the eland in the watering hole. If you wish, you can stay there all day, and even into the evening. The, uh, the equator runs through Kenya, so being on the equator, they don't have much in the way of seasons. They have dry seasons and wet seasons, but they don't have spring, summer, autumn, etc. So the sun rises at 6 o'clock and the sun sets at 6 o'clock pretty much every day because it's on the equator. But that doesn't mean that half your day is wasted because the watering holes are often floodlit, so you can continue to watch the animals come and go into the evening. The animals really don't care about the fact that they're floodlit. As far as the animals is concer are concerned, it's sort of just like, well, there's another full moon over there illuminating the ground. Um, if anything, it makes the uh, animals like zebras a little bit happier because they can see the lions coming uh, if it's floodlit. So you can continue to take pictures beyond sunset well into the night if you so wish. Whilst we were there, I thought, well... The skies are beautifully dark here. I've always been interested in astronomy, so looking out at night and seeing a beautiful dark sky, I wondered, can you actually take decent pictures of the night sky? So I simply put the camera on a tripod, pointed it upwards. This happens to be a, a relatively wide-angle lens. It's looking at a patch of sky, for those who know their constellations. This is looking at a patch of sky containing Sagittarius and Scorpius. Um, some of you may actually recognize the S of Scorpius there. There's the sting in the tail, there's the body of the scorpion, and the claws are at this end. So with photographic film, remember this is 2003, this is 20 years ago, my first attempt to take pictures under a dark sky, having been somewhat thwarted by trying the same thing in England, it catches the stars quite nicely. This is a short exposure, the bright stars show up nicely. But what there should be there is the swathe of the Milky Way, which was visible by eye but doesn't seem to show up in the photographs. Perhaps you can see just a little bit of a smudge in the middle. The Milky Way is absolutely spectacular from a dark sky sight. It's all of the stars in our own galaxy that show up as a band of light across the sky. 
kids today in England seem to not realise the fact that it should be there because light pollution is stopping us seeing it. But unfortunately, photographic film doesn't really have the sensitivity to pick up the fainter parts of the Milky Way. So it picks up the bright stars, okay, we can see the constellations, but we can't see the Milky Way. So I thought it was worth doing, but in a sense it was a little bit disappointing. So I thought, well, ho-hum, at least I tried. We moved on to uh, various other lodges. This particular lodge is a very sort of colourful one in the sense that it has a particular characteristic, and that is that they put all the rooms on stilts. That way, everybody gets a great view over the grasslands and can see animals just a little bit further because of that elevation. So that's a, quite a nice idea to have the rooms on stilts. Some rooms are actually perched on the edge of craters. For instance, here in Tanzania is the Ngoro Ngoro crater in which one of the lodges is perched right on the crater rim and so your, all of the rooms look out over the entire crater floor itself, an entire ecosystem to itself because although it's not impossible, animals tend to stay within the crater rather than try and roam up the rather steep walls. It's not impossible for animals to get in and out, but basically it's almost like its own little ecosystem. So that was quite an interesting place to stay and gave some spectacular views in the morning and the evening as the light hit the crater rim. Some parts of Africa can be a little bit dusty and a little bit barren, in the dry season, and unfortunately Africa does have droughts every once in a while, depending on what El Nino is doing. But sometimes you forget that parts of Africa can be very lush. So this happens to be the grounds of one of the lodges. This is Kikorok Lodge in the middle of the Maasai Mara. And it reminds you that as long as there's a little bit of rain now and again, the greenery is extremely green. And that, of course, means lots of bird life and lots of animal life throughout the entire range of the Maasai Mara. All of the grasslands turn green when they get the rain. It gets a little bit browner when the, uh, the rains fail and drought conditions start to return. But many a time I've been to Kenya, it's been more like that than it has been a dust bowl. This is Altakai Lodge in Amboseli. Amboseli National Park is famous for having lots of elephants, and therefore a lot of tourists go to Amboseli because of the elephants. Well, that's one good reason for going there. You are guaranteed to see lots of elephants if you go to Amboseli, somewhat south towards the south of Nairobi, towards the boundary, towards the border of Kenya and Tanzania. But that's not necessarily the reason my friends and I go there. There's my friend Rob sitting outside his room. The grounds are beautiful. If you're interested in bird life, which my friends are perhaps a little more so than me, I'll photograph anything, but they are particularly interested in birds. And they will spend many a happy hour just going around the grounds. There's no need to leave the grounds of the lodge and go venturing further afield. If you wish, you can stay in one place and just do a little bit of a walk and perhaps see a hundred species of bird. It can be quite spectacular. A slightly different view of the same lodge in Amboseli gives you an impression that maybe there's a prevailing wind uh, in, in this particular area. And yes, it's not necessarily that strong, but it does tend to blow from the same direction. But you notice here that there's an awful lot of trees around, and you may think, well, that's not very good for astrophotography. If you can't see the sky, how can you possibly photograph the stars if the entire lodge grounds are full of trees? Well, there are lots of trees, but perhaps you notice over to the right-hand side, the trees peter out a bit. So if you walk over to this side, you can actually find yourself a patch of ground in which the sky just opens up. And it's a beautiful place to do astrophotography. Not least because what you can barely make out on the horizon here is an electric fence. That means it keeps the baddies out. Okay, there aren't that many big cats around anyway, but it keeps the dangerous animals away. So you can go out at night, set up your camera, and take pictures of the night sky. And because this particular lodge has got an electric fence, which seems very effective, that's one of our favourite places to go because we know we can see wildlife and we can know we see the night sky because of this safety angle of knowing that we're safe to go out at night. It can still be a bit unnerving. I've been out in that sort of location more than once 
and I've set up the camera, started taking pictures of the night sky, thinking, this is great, and then I hear a rustle in the distance on the other side of the electric fence, and I think, hmm, okay, there's something out there. Is this something I should worry about, or do I just trust that they remember to switch the electric fence on tonight? <laughs> And occasionally, I just take a torch and say, well, there might be something out there. Let's just scan the horizon and see. Oh, yes, there's 50 sets of eyes looking back at me. <laughs> but eventually, I learned, that, ah, there's zebra. That's OK. There's zebra I can deal with, as long as it's nothing more vicious than that. So this is a very nice place to do some astrophotography. So again, back in 2003, I had a crack from this particular location. It looks like the trees are on fire. Um, it's not quite bad. For the guests' safety, they have to illuminate the paths, even throughout the night, pretty much like streetlights in England. But they are very low-level lights, just enough so you can see that you don't trip up. A small amount of light gets reflected back into the trees, so the trees are not anything like as bright as these photos would sort of indicate. There's just a little bit of light in the trees. What's important here is that here I've taken a couple of pictures, a relatively short exposure and a somewhat longer exposure. Notice that the stars have definitely moved here. This is unfortunate. The Earth rotates. I'm not sure if you noticed that, but the Earth rotates once a day. So if you fix a camera on a tripod and take a long exposure, basically as the Earth rotates, the sky will appear to move and the stars will trail. So, shorter exposures not trailing so much, longer exposures it trails more. But generally speaking, you want to expose for as long as possible to catch all of the light of the objects that you want to photograph, in this case, the Milky Way, which is a band running from sort of the horizon down here, all the way up here, overhead, and down to the other horizon. So, these pictures show that we have managed to catch a little bit of the structure of the Milky Way. There's a little bit more showing now with a slightly longer exposure. But because the Earth has rotated and the stars have trailed, the detail that would otherwise be visible in this picture of the Milky Way, that has itself has been blurred out. So we can't see the detail. Even though we've tried to capture more light from the Milky Way, it's all blurred because of the rotation of the Earth. So back in 2003, I was thinking, OK, it's a bit of a shame. We have these beautiful dark skies, but we can't get images of nice, sharp stars and all of the detail that's in the Milky Way because we have a fixed camera. We have to find some way of dealing with that. Again, this is 2003. This is still film. This is actually slide film from 20 years ago. But it convinced me that it was worth persevering on another trip to Kenya and thinking about how astrophotography could be improved. Some lodges are made with uh, stone. Some lodges are tented camps, or uh, some camps are tented camps. So here we have a bit of canvas underneath a sort of uh, a roof to keep it dry if it really does pour with rain. You can see that there were so many trees around here, it would be almost impossible from this location to do any astrophotography at night. But there are various places where you find that there are some trees which give you shade and some areas clear of trees in which you can take nice pictures of the night sky. This is Governor's Camp. Some of you may have heard of this because that's where the BBC film their Big Cat Diary series, for instance. And you look at this and you say, well, there's a nice uh, tent there. And if I was in that tent, I would simply come out at night and put my camera down here, and I'd get wonderful views of the night sky. Well, in principle, yes. But this is a tented camp, and generally speaking, tented camps tend not to have electric fences, which means if you go out at night, you have to worry about the animals. And here, the people who ran this camp basically said, you do not leave your tent at night, OK? And I thought, oh, they're just egging that up for the sake of the tourists. They're just making it sound like it's really dangerous out here. But I'm sure it would be OK, really. But on the first night, I thought, well, I'd better give them the benefit of the doubt. So I didn't go out on the first night. I stayed ensconced in my tent for all of the dark hours. The next morning, on the little pathway outside my tent, I saw a footprint. And I don't know, but I am told that this is the footprint of a lioness. 
So a lioness walked in front of my tent during the middle of the night, and I was completely unaware of that. And this reminded me that if the, the organizers of a particular camp, if the owners of a particular camp say, do not leave your tent at night, they really do mean it. There might be elephants, there might be big cats, there might be other dangerous things lurking. Without an electric fence, you should not attempt any astrophotography. This is one of the reasons that Amboseli is so fantastic. We know it's safe. So I thought, yeah, okay, that's, that's the sort of animal I don't want to meet in the middle of the night. This is um, south of the border, so now we're in Tanzania rather than in Kenya, uh, a rather nice tented camp called Rufiji River Camp. Uh, and again, it was nice because the Rufiji River gives you the option of boat trips, and so you can see a different set of animals and birds by the riverside rather than in the middle of the bush. But whilst I was here, I thought, well, a little bit further south, because we're now south of the equator by only a few degrees compared to the 52 degrees north of England, for instance, 52 or 53 degrees. But I thought we're now just a little bit south of the equator, so it's worth having another crack at seeing what we can do with photographs. This is now 2005, so I've now grown up, and I'm now digital. So I've got rid of my 35mm camera and slide film. I've now got a digital camera. And so I pointed at the sky and try taking pictures. And now I'm starting to see more detail in the Milky Way. You can see the band of the Milky Way now stretches across a relatively large chunk of sky. Again, the brightest part in the middle, that's the center of our galaxy, the center of the Milky Way, something that we can't see very well from England because of just the way the geometry works out. As seen from northern latitudes, i.e. the UK, the center of the Milky Way, the center of our galaxy, is essentially just skirting our horizons in the middle of summer. But if we go down to the equator, the center of the galaxy is high in the sky and it's much easier for us to photograph it. So I took quite a few pictures. I thought, this is interesting. There's clearly an enormous amount of information, an enormous amount of detail we could get out of the Milky Way if we could just stop these stars trailing. So what we need is some mechanism that compensates for the fact that the Earth is rotating. If the Earth is rotating, make, making the stars appear to move, what we need is some way of driving our camera in the opposite direction to follow the stars. So instead of the stars coming out of streaks of light, the stars will remain pinpoint. So as of 2005, I thought this is the last time I'm going to try taking a picture with a static camera. Next time I come to either Kenya or Tanzania, I'm going to bring myself a motorized version of, of how to put the camera on a tripod such that the camera will follow the stars rather than just let the stars trail. So things will change after 2005. Okay, so that's my attempts at Astro. Let's temporarily go back to the wild idea. So if you wanted to take photographs of wild animals, you could just stay in the lodge and let the animals come to your watering hole, or you can go on game drives. Game drives will often take a couple of hours or so, and generally speaking, will start at sunrise uh, for a couple of hours, and then the rest of the day you do nothing in particular, rather than sit around and drink beer if you prefer. And at the end of the day, you have another game drive that finishes at sunset. Basically, in Kenya, it's not advisable to go out at night because you're disturbing the animals when they're doing their hunting, the nocturnal animals, whereas it's perfectly okay to go uh, looking at animals in the morning and in the afternoon. It's still not advisable to go chasing animals. It's frowned upon to say, there's an animal over there, let's come off the road and start chasing it. Generally speaking, you still have the idea of let the animals come to you. If you're quiet enough and patient enough, the animals will come to you. So there's uh, me and a few of my friends in our safari bus. Notice that it's a bus with a roof that lifts up. That means that you always have shade, and when the roof is lifted up, you have a 360-degree unimpeded view. And so all you need is to have a few individuals who are on the lookout for any animals that are in front of you, behind you, on the left or on the right. It's good to have four people, because then you can all point in different directions of the compass. For those with keen eyesight, you may notice that's Kilimanjaro in the background there. So we are on safari in Kenya. 
Kilimanjaro is actually in Tanzania, so that's in a different country, but it's a large enough mountain that it's visible from quite some distance. But a game drive often looks like this, people on the lookout for what's out there. Our preference, my friends and I, is not to tell our driver, go find us some lion. We'd much rather just say, drive, and let's see what we see. So we just drive in a random direction and then start looking out for what animals exist, either close to us or in the more distant trees or in the very distant trees, and then we decide where it is we're going to go, not chasing animals, but going into the best places that we think we've got a good chance of catching birds or catching some mammals. Do you need a lot of photographic gear for doing this? Some birds are quite small and quite far away. But generally speaking, as long as you don't hassle them, animals don't necessarily run away. They don't necessarily see tourists as a threat. So as long as you don't shout or wear, wear very powerful aftershave or perfume, you won't necessarily scare off the animals. So the idea that you need a really huge telephoto lens... Oh, you've got to admire the biceps on this guy, haven't you? Look at that. So yes, that is a real lens, a Sigma 200 to 500 zoom lens. I don't know of anybody who actually thinks that's a good idea to take on safari because you would need a Sherpa to carry it for you, to carry it around. There are people who say, well, I'm interested in birds and birds are always a long way away and the birds are tiny, so I'm going to need a really long telephoto in order to capture them. And there are some serious bird watchers who do end up getting large telephoto lenses for precisely that reason. I have found after many safaris that you don't actually need a telephoto lens longer than about 300 millimeters. Uh, for those that don't know photography, a standard lens would be something of order 35 to 50 millimeters focal length. So a 300 millimeter focal length telephoto lens is only a magnification factor of about five or six. It's like a relatively low powered binocular. But that's actually all you need to capture most animals. Because generally speaking, animals are not one kilometre away. They are quite likely to be relatively close to tourists, as long as you're patient, as long as you're quiet. So, for instance, to get this picture of a, a male lion, it seems to be almost posing for us. Well, it is posing for us, actually. It's there. There's a little bit of a breeze blowing on the mane, so he's just sort of pointing snout into the wind to give him the best possible uh, appearance, as it were. But lions, like many other predators, do not see tourists as a threat. They're not food because they keep staying inside their vans and cars, etc., so you can't get at them. So there's no point in attacking them. They're not food. They're not a threat. Therefore, they just ignore us. And so, to give you an idea of how close you can get to a lion, that gives you an idea because my friend took a picture of my left ear, and you can see that the lion is only what, 10 or so metres away. And if they're that sort of distance, a 300 millimetre lens is more than enough to get a nice head and shoulders shot of a lion. Even if the lion was further away, you can still, using digital photography, take a picture of a more distant animal and maybe crop it slightly to give you a very nice image at the end of the day. So yes, you can get close. And again, it comes down to the skill of the driver guide. Because, for instance, we uh, came close to a leopard, and I was definitely keen on getting a nice close-up of a leopard. The leopard was some distance away, and I thought to myself, maybe if we drive a little bit further up this road, we can get closer to the leopard. And our driver said, no, the leopard is over there, we are going to reverse, and then we're going to go over here, because that leopard is thirsty, and that leopard is going to want to go to that watering hole. And if we go over here and park and wait, the leopard is going to walk straight past us and then you'll be able to get the shot that you want. So we thought, okay, and of course he was right. The leopard walked right in front of the van. The leopard didn't even look up at us. It just walked straight past, it did not see us as a threat, it wanted to get from A to B. The fact that there was a white van there with people with cameras clicking away was of no concern to it whatsoever. And you can get beautiful close-ups of animals like that. 
beautiful, beautiful animal. This is what a game drive usually starts like. We, we're told, right, we'll have a game drive at 4 o'clock and we'll be back at 6 o'clock or 6.30 just after sunset. So he said, right, okay, we're game. We've got our cameras ready. We've got our binoculars ready. As soon as our driver shows up, we're going to go out for a game drive and then we get lots of pictures of animals. What you do when the game drive is finished is you come back to the lodge and then you start looking on the back of the camera. Remember, in the old days, with 35mm film, you would take a number of pictures and you had no idea whether or not they came out correctly framed. You had no idea if they were in focus. You just hoped that you got a few images, and then when you got home, you put them all in for processing, and then you see what you got. But with digital photography, you can see your images on the back of the camera. So as soon as the game drive is over, you can do some chimping. Do you know what chimping is? That's when you look on the back of the camera at the images you've just taken, and you go, ooh, 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 ah, ah, yeah. Yeah, I caught it. I, I wanted to catch that bird just as it started to fly. I wanted to catch that baboon just as it was yawning. And yes, I got it. Fantastic. So that's what chimping is. Looking at the back of your camera after a game drive, deciding that, well, your shot is better than my shot, or something like that. Let me show you a few examples of the sort of wildlife you can catch if you've got a camera with a telephoto lens, preferably up to 200 or 300 millimeters focal length. And these days, virtually every camera, every zoom camera, for instance, every bridge camera will have something that encompasses that range. Let me show you what you can do with a little bit of technology, but mainly patience and an eye and also a good driver guide taking you to the right places. I'm sure you can't quite see what that is. That's a panorama taken over quite a few frames. Let me blow up a little bit of it so you can see. Wildebeest. Lots and lots and lots of wildebeest. I'm a scientist, so when I look at wildebeest, I think, well, how many wildebeest are there per square meter? And how many square meters am I looking at? This herd of wildebeest was probably about a million strong. Uh, a little while earlier, one to two million wildebeest had come, migrated from Tanzania, and moved through Kenya. They follow the grass, the grass follows the rain. So this wildebeest migration is a cycle that goes on every year. And if you visit at certain times of the year, you will find lots of wildebeest. Lots of wildebeest, quite a few zebra, and of course, if there's lots of grazing animals, that means there's lots of predators who are quite happy to eat some of those grazing animals. Lions can't possibly take that many wildebeest. So even if there's lots of lions there, they will still only take a tiny fraction of a million wildebeest. There's also a few uh, other animals in there. I won't sort of play a work, where's Waldo sort of thing. Uh, but that gives you an idea of just what you can see. That's just parking at one place and just looking around you. And you realize that the richness and the biodiversity in East Africa is quite phenomenal. And it's not just on the ground. We drove to a lake expecting to find some flamingo. We were rather amazed to find the sky was just full of pelicans. So remember, pelicans are quite big birds, and when you see a thousand of them wheeling above you in the sky, it is quite an amazing sight, and wasn't something we were expecting when we went to a particular lake in the, in the Rift Valley. We're curious about animals, but we sometimes forget that animals are curious about us. They don't necessarily see us as a threat, but in some cases, like this youngster on the left, it might be the first time they've seen a tourist. So mother has to sort of teach the youngster, don't worry, there's nothing to see here, don't go any closer, they're not dangerous, but you shouldn't go and sort of start licking the tourists. Just stay where you are, and it's okay to look, but don't go any closer. And here the zebra just seem to be more interested in what we're doing. They're not scared, they're not running away, they're just rather curious. The lioness in the bottom right is a little different. She came out of the grass and gave us a damn good stare. And it wasn't obvious why. We thought, is she interested in us? She doesn't seem to be threatening us. But then we realized what it was. She had cubs 
in the grass. And of course, you never get between a lioness and her cubs. And this lioness, the, the behavior was very interesting. We realized afterwards the cubs were working, working their way across the grass. And the lioness simply popped up onto this log and stayed between us and the cubs for as long as the cubs were walking through this particular bit of grass. Every once in a while, she looked over her shoulder. And as soon as she looked over her shoulder, that's when I caught this particular picture of her looking in our direction. But it was fairly obvious to us. You have to be careful of applying human emotions to animals. But it was fairly obvious to us that she was saying, she's in charge. These are her babies in the grass here. She's in charge. She's quite happy for us to stay there and take pictures, but no closer. And we're fairly sure that if we attempted to get any closer, which we wouldn't do, she would not have necessarily been OK with that. So this was a rather nice little encounter, as it were. And a few minutes later, once the cubs had moved out of this grass and were elsewhere, she came off the log and just moved away. Not threatening, just making it clear that she was in charge of this situation. Yes, you can occasionally hide cubs in long grass. You can even hide half an elephant in long grass, depending on the time of year. If they just have the rains, the grasses can be quite long. If the wildebeest haven't come in yet as a huge lawnmower to keep the grass down, then the grass can be quite tall. Not only can you hide an elephant, well, sometimes you can hide a giraffe. <laughs> you can argue as to whether or not this giraffe is an adult giraffe or a baby giraffe. Is it standing up or is it lying down? I, I prefer to think of it as an adult standing up, but probably it isn't. But you can see that at certain times of year, the grass can be a meter or so high. And yes, you can lose some of the smaller animals. That's sometimes a problem, but it also means you get more serendipitous. An, an animal can suddenly pop out of nowhere because you didn't see it coming from 100 meters away because the grass was too long. Generally, depending on the time of year you go, the grass will be shorter, and the grass might only be centimetres in length um, because the wildebeest and the zebra and all the other grazing animals have already been through. I quite like this photo for a number of different reasons, not least because it was taken at sunrise, and the sun is coming from the top left, and the sun is just catching the seed heads of the grass here. It gives a beautiful illumination. And it's much better to get the light coming in from the side than it is to take pictures in the middle of the day and have the sun coming directly from above. But I also like this picture because it's a family portrait. It's zebras doing what zebras do, which is eat grass. And you can see that they're basically all munching, apart from one, which has got its head up, keeping an eye out for lions. There's always one just scanning the horizon, just in case, to make sure that all the zebras in that family are safe. If we have a look at the few birds, birds is not my speciality, but my friends have taken lots of species of birds. Here's a few of them. Starlings. In the UK, we have a starling. In East Africa, they have a dozen different starlings, all of which are beautiful colored feathers and iridescence. So we have a red-winged starling here. You can see the labels, uh, golden-breasted starling. For those that are particularly interested in which animal corresponds to which name, I'm not expecting you to read all these labels. I have got handouts if anybody wants to go back and just check what was that bird that was shown in that slide, for instance. Here's a few more starlings. That one in the middle looks really mean, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's the sort of starling that's waiting for ca catching some crumbs or something and is not getting any, like a seagull waiting for the fish and chips. So again, you can see the beautiful plumage. Here's a blue-eared starling, and you can see the iridescence and the blue and the greens coming out in the feathers here. Lots of little birds. I'm not going to go through them all, but there are hundreds of species, all of which are different. There are a little bit of an overlap with some species in the UK, but generally a lot of the species visible uh, uh, that can be seen in East Africa will be unique to East Africa and won't be necessarily seen in Europe as well. So lots of interesting little birds, lots of very colourful birds, one that you might recognise, it's not actually the same species, but it's very similar to the UK kingfisher. But again, just like starlings, we have a kingfisher, they have at least half a dozen different types of kingfisher, from very small ones 
to giant ones. So again, you have lots of species to look out for, either within the grounds of a lodge or when you're out on a game drive looking at bushes and trees. Sometimes they're very um, well-mannered. This is taken from Tanzania, from the Rufiji River camp. So this is on a boat trip, looking at animals that are making nests in the river banks. And occasionally they will play ball and line up on a stump here, almost inviting you to take the picture when they're in that sort of mood, as it were. This is the lilac-breasted roller. It's the national bird of Kenya. Perhaps you can see why it's called lilac-breasted. It has beautiful plumage, li lilacs and light blues and dark blues. And some of the colours of this bird don't really show up until it flies. And the number of times we've come across a bird sitting on a branch thinking, OK, you can fly now. OK, I'm waiting here. I'm waiting. Fly. Fly. OK, is somebody going to make a noise? Is somebody going to bang the door? Is somebody going to stamp their feet? And as soon as you look away, off it goes. <laughs> but every once in a while, you can just about catch it as it flies, and you see the beautiful plumage. There's an, an electric blue set of underfeathers on its uh, wings, and catching it in the sunlight is one of the challenges uh, for this particular animal. It seems to want to spend most of its time sitting in a branch rather than flying. It doesn't seem to know it's a bird some of the time. But again, when you get it right, you get some beautiful results. There are lots of big birds. Some of these you recognize. I'm sure everybody recognizes the bird in the top left, for instance. There are various storks and cranes. And you can see a heron here, which is, again, a very close cousin to the herons that we get within the UK. Some of these big birds are very much dependent, uh, very much specific to East Africa rather than in the UK, such as this rather odd-looking bird called the hammercop, and these large birds called quarry bustards, and perhaps you've heard of secretary birds as well. So again, these are the, the ones in the middle there. The secretary birds are birds of prey. They look very odd, but perhaps you can tell from the uh, the beak and the curved beak, it is actually a raptor, unlike the other two. There are plenty of raptors. There are lots of buzzards. There are huge numbers of eagles. If you wanted to take pictures of raptors, there are plenty to choose from. This is an auger buzzard, and there's lots of those all over the place in the inset there. That's a lappet-faced vulture. And again, there's lots of vultures around. In the case of buzzards, all you really need to do is wait by something that's going to generate a thermal. If you go out in the early morning before the air has warmed up much, stand next to a hill which is starting to generate thermals and a little bit of a breeze is starting to blow up the hill, you'll find buzzards start to gather to catch those thermals. So you don't need to go out looking for them, you just have to identify the geography of what's around you. And in this particular case, I just planted myself and waited for these buzzards to start circling. And every once in a while, they came close enough to get a shot of a bird that filled the frame, again, with a 300 millimeter lens. Clearly, once the thermals take them much higher, they start to get a little bit smaller in your field of view. But you can catch them only a few tens of meters away and catch pictures like this. Again, lots of different raptors, from large ones like uh, African fish eagle to very small ones like the grey kestrel there, only about Yosai, about the same size as a UK kestrel, roughly speaking. And the beauty of digital photography is, even if this bird is in a tree which is quite some distance away, unlike with film, if you take a picture on film and try to blow it up, you get a lot of grainy results because of the grain of the film. With digital photography, as long as you've got a reasonable number of pixels in the sensor on your camera, you can take, take a picture of a bird some distance away and blow it up. This was a complete fish eagle, which I simply cropped to just show the head. And you can see wonderful detail. And so you don't have to worry about, this bird is too far away for me to get a good shot. It can be quite a large distance, many tens of meters away, 100 meters away. And with a telephoto lens, and you crop it down slightly, you can still get wonderful pictures, wonderful close-ups of these raptors. Sometimes they just sit there doing nothing. And again, you can say, OK, I've got a picture of a raptor. Um, it's a tawny eagle. OK, I've got a picture of a tawny eagle. Is it going to do anything? Well, possibly not. You can either say to your driver, move on, I've got a picture of it, 
or you say to your driver, no, just hang on a second, let's just wait, and can we catch, yes, let's just catch it just as it's starting to take off, and it starts to uh, deploy the wings, and you get a more dynamic picture. Every once in a while, you take a picture and you think, what is that? <laughs> that got us thinking for a while when we looked at that, and we saw there's something in the bush there. What is it? Take a picture, look at it on the back of the camera. Its head has exploded. Um, what, what's going on here? And of course, it's fairly obvious once you realize the explanation, just like owls, and many of you have seen them, they can turn their heads 180 degrees. If a, if a bird turns its head 180 degrees, when it's looking forward, it looks normal. When it's looking backwards, the feathers on the back of its neck can't lie flat, and so it just ends up sticking up. So it gives a rather odd-looking result, but it's just a bird looking in the other direction. Perfectly normal explanation. It's just nice that occasionally you come across these things and think, what is going on there? Plenty of water bursts because there's plenty of water, not necessarily water in the sense of rain, but water in the sense of lakes. Running through East Africa is the Great Rift Valley, which means the rock has faulted, and where you have faulted rock, you can get lakes forming, some fresh water, some soda water. And so you have lots of lakes, and therefore you have lots of opportunities to photograph water birds. In the bottom left, that's actually a, a cousin of the lily trotter, or a member of the lily trotter family, and I've taken that picture deliberately to give the environment to remind you that this is actually sitting on a huge lily, set of lily pads. You can, if you wish, blow it up to see the bird more clearly, and then you get the beautiful colours of the African jacana. But again, that's the advantage of digital photography. You can either take the wide-angle shot equivalent and get the context, or you can crop it down to the bird itself and still maintain a lot of detail. That's the beauty of digital photography. I don't really need to tell you what that is. There's plenty of flamingos in East Africa, sometimes just a few tens of thousands, sometimes half a million, depending on which lake you happen to visit. And if you're lucky enough to catch them in flight, they make a wonderful subject. But again, with water, you have the option of thinking about reflections. Because, of course, whenever you have birds in water, you will always have the opportunity to find some rather nice-looking reflections. I quite like that one. The cormorant, again, is a very close cousin to the cormorant we have in the UK, but having it sit on a rock just to get its perfect reflection with its tail just sticking in the water, I was quite uh, pleased that that one just happened to stay put long enough for me to catch the picture. And it's not just birds. Sometimes animals are quite happy to wade into the water and give you the opportunity to get some very nice reflections. This one is a very old picture. Again, that's about 20 years old, that zebra picture. But it's one of my favourites just because it's a beautiful reflection of the zebra. And you start asking yourself, what was that zebra thinking about? Was it just staring off into the horizon thinking, what shall I have for breakfast? Um, I don't know. The middle one is a bit confusing because you're trying to work out, is that sky or is that water? And is that sky or is that water? The answer is they're both water. Um, this is a watering hole which happens to have a bit of grass down the middle, so we're not looking at any sky there. And I was uh, just photographing this uh, impala and one of its uh, young foals jumping around uh, by the side of the watering hole. Lions hunt at night, which means during the day they do very little other than sit under trees and invite tourists to come and photograph them, which means getting pictures of lions is dead easy. In this particular case, a couple of young brothers were just play fighting with each other. That doesn't mean that all fighting is play fighting. Sometimes fighting is for real. So these vultures, I'm not sure quite what they're fighting over, but they were definitely um, tearing each other's flight feathers out, so it's definitely serious. In the top right, hippos are fighting for territory in the water. In the bottom, lions and hyenas are fighting over food. And in the bottom left, buffalo are fighting just because they're buffalo, and that's what they do. But occasionally they take a pop at us, so some elephants don't like us getting too close. Elephant herds are fine. Lone male bull elephants can be a little tetchy, and if you get just a little bit too close to them, they can just basically say, no, go away, and they'll give you a damn good chase. But generally speaking, they can't run as fast as a good safari van, so you're safe. 
There's always serendipity. There's always something that you can't plan for. In this particular case, I wanted to photograph this crowned crane sitting um, on this branch on the left-hand side. I was just about to take a picture of the left-hand bird when I noticed through my other eye, I'm right-eyed, so I was looking through the camera with my right eye, and my left eye picked up on the fact that its mate was coming in from behind and was about to land next to it. So as it came in, out go the air brakes, and it lands next to its partner. And I was just lucky that the wing happens not to obscure the outline of the first bird. So that is just pure luck that I was in the right place at the right time. And that's a lot of what wildlife photography is about. When a friend of mine said, what's that in the tree? I said, nothing, I can't see anything in the tree. And then we looked a little closer. Oh, yes, there is something in the tree. There's a lion in the tree, sleeping. On the way back to the lodge, we suddenly found ourselves outpaced by a cheetah. We were going fairly fast, but this cheetah basically said, I can go faster. And you can see from the blurring there that I couldn't possibly keep that cheetah in focus and move the camera fast enough to follow it. Sorry about the pun for the title on this one, but uh, what, should, what should have been a dusty plain, we visited this place a few times. But back in 2019, we visited, and lo and behold, this dusty plain had turned into a lake. Not because of heavy rain, not because of flooding, but the aquifers, the actual water level below the ground, had changed for some reason. Meltwater from Kilimanjaro was underground, and for some reason the aquifer changed, and suddenly this area flooded. It's only ankle high to a zebra, but it meant that they wanted to get from A to B, and rather than go round this lake, they normally go from A to B in a straight line, so they continued to do so even though it was flooded. And it gave a rather nice image of the zebras and the flamingos. So I must start to wrap up. So I'm not sure if you're getting bored of all this, but... Um, uh, I've done most of what I want to do on the wild, and of course, during the day, once the sun goes down, there's not an awful lot you can do with animals because you shouldn't be disturbing the animals at night. So once the sun sets, you forget the animals, but you revert back to the astro. So let me finish with what the astro has developed into. Remember what I said earlier, if you have a static camera, the stars will trail, and you'll never get nice, sharp stars, and you'll never see detail in the Milky Way. So what's the solution? I decided to buy myself a tracker. Correction, I first decided to build myself a tracker. This is a do-it-yourself, you can perhaps tell, bits of aluminium and a couple of AA batteries and a small motor and a couple of hinges on the left-hand side. It's a device that will move the camera in such a way that as the Earth rotates and the stars appear to trail across the sky, this device will move the camera at, hopefully, one revolution per day, the same rate at which the Earth spins, and will then keep the stars as pinpoints rather than as trails. You don't have to build one of these yourselves. This will cost you about 20 quid if you wanted to build one. You can go out and buy them, and basically that's what it looks like. You can put your camera with either a wide-angle lens or a telephoto lens on top of this box. The box sits on a tripod, so the bottom of the box is fixed, but the top of the box will rotate at one revolution per day. This disc here rotates at one revolution per day and will then track the stars. That's what it looks like in a box. There's nothing special about it. It's basically just a motor in a box. And it's just special because it rotates at exactly the right rate as the rotation speed of the Earth. So basically batteries, a little bit of a controller, a motor and gearbox, and then a worm and wheel to give you the rotation speed. Of course, if a motor is spinning fast and you want the actual output to be one revolution per day, you need a substantial reduction gearbox to give you the right gearing. But it means that you can then take pictures of the night sky and the stars come out as pinpoints rather than streaks. This particular one is not pointing at the Milky Way, so we're just looking at a patch of sky. Again, the trees aren't actually that bright. It's just a little bit of light reflected from the path lights to make sure you don't twist your ankle as you go out at night. But because we can now take pictures in a few minutes and not worry about the stars trailing, we can get some nice, interesting images. 
For instance, the Milky Way galaxy, our home galaxy, actually has a couple of small galaxies rotating around it. Just like the moon rotates around the Earth as a satellite, so there are a couple of small satellites that rotate around the Milky Way. So the Milky Way has little companions called Magellanic Clouds, large and small Magellanic Clouds. We can't see them from England because they're too far south. They're sort of close to the South Pole, the South Celestial Pole. So they never rise above the horizon in the UK. So we can never see them from here. But from the equator, we can catch them. And here, with a few exposures added together and an 85 millimeter lens, not a particularly long telephoto by any means, it's a fairly large galaxy in the sky, I've managed to catch this satellite galaxy as well as, obviously, a few stars in there as well. This particular object, again, is too far south to see from the UK, which is why I picked these particular targets to try and photograph. This is an object called Eta Carina. It's a star that's very unstable and probably coming to the end of its life. This is a candidate, maybe, to be the ne next supernova. Perhaps before too long, this star, which is right at the centre of this particular nebula, that might be coming to the end of its life and going to blow itself to pieces as a supernova. Most of the gas you can see here, the pink and slightly blue stuff, are bits that used to be the atmosphere of the star, but they've been shrugged off over the last few thousand, 10,000, 20,000 years, this star is so unstable, it's been shrugging off these outer parts of its atmosphere and producing this huge nebula. Again, an 85 millimeter lens, not a particularly long telephoto. Again, this object is quite a large object in the sky, but you wouldn't be able to photograph it unless you could track the stars and stop them trailing. So this is a rather nice one. It's another reminder that the camera that you use to take pictures in daylight can also be used without any modification to take pictures of the night sky. Not only can you see interesting detail in these objects, it brings out the colors beautifully. You don't need to modify a camera that's designed for daylight in order to use it to take pictures of a huge hydrogen cloud floating in space. The same camera will do both jobs. As for the Milky Way itself, well, I'm sure some of you will have seen the Milky Way from some reasonably dark sky sites in the UK, if you can get away from light pollution, and you see it as a band of light crossing the sky. Here I've tried to indicate what the Milky Way might look like in the UK versus this, which is what it might look like from Kenya. You see even more detail. Even with the naked eye, you can see the brightest part of the Milky Way, and you can see these dark dust flames. These are dusty parts of the galaxy which are blocking light from more distant parts of the galaxy. More distant stars are being blocked by these rather dark, dusty lanes there. And that is almost what you see with the naked eye. The Milky Way is so bright from a dark sky site that you can essentially see all of that detail. But of course, if you photograph it, you not only see all of that detail, but you get the color coming out as well. Our eyes don't work well in color at low light. So basically, everything we see at night is pretty much monochrome. But the camera will record the color that is actually present. If we remind ourselves of what we used to get with photographic film, we could see the constellation of Scorpius, this characteristic S shape of the scorpion with a sting in the tail at this end and claws at this end. And when we look at this picture, there were so many faint stars there, we can hardly see the bright stars anymore. There's so much detail in the Milky Way, it's difficult now to see the constellation. It's still there. If I join the dots for the stars in this picture on the right-hand side, Scorpius is still there. But it's just so much more difficult when all of the faint stuff is captured by the digital image, whereas the faint stuff was not captured by photographic film. There are a couple of interlopers in this particular image of the Milky Way. You notice there's an awful lot going on in this diagonal. There's a bright red giant star over on this side, but the elephant in the room is this really bright object over there. But that's Jupiter. It's not a star at all. So there's Jupiter at the top, and there's also Saturn just creeping in to the left-hand edge. 
Of course, where Jupiter and Saturn will be will change year on year because Jupiter and Saturn are going around the Sun. So that same chunk of Milky Way won't look the same in another year's time because the planets will have moved relative to the Milky Way. So the message really is, if you're going to some part of the world for some reason, whether it's for the locations, whether it's for the landscapes, whether it's for the animals, don't forget that if you're moving to areas of the world that are a long way from light pollution, it might be that your camera is perfectly capable of capturing pictures of the night sky, and it might be worth thinking about whether or not a little tracker, a motor in a box, will enable you to get the sort of pictures that I've been showing here. It only adds a little bit to the weight of your luggage. It's probably less than a kilogram or so. If you've got a 20 kilogram um, luggage allowance, if you're flying to various parts of the world, it doesn't take that much. If you're taking a camera anyway, why not think about taking a tracker? And then if you've got access to the Milky Way because you've got a dark sky sight, you can end up with images that look like that. So I've come to the end of wild astronomy and I hope you've enjoyed my particular take on going on safari. Thank you very much. <laughs>